Hi, Jeff Tischer here again. Uh, today I'm going to talk about the uses of computational complexity. Um, over time, this might be something that I can move into more of a, uh, a specific talk about how computational complexity is derived, but that's a very complicated topic, so it's not something I'm going to be touching on today. This will be about the situations where we apply it and why. Um, if you want a more in-depth mathematical explanation of some of these terms, uh, you can search for computational complexity or big O notation uh, on YouTube and there's already a bunch of great resources where they go into a lot of detail on this in a very concise, in a surprisingly concise and direct way. So um, that, that's useful background. I'm not going to duplicate that here though because they already did a good job with that. So first of all, what is computational complexity? Well, it's the measurement of the cost of an algorithm uh, as a function of its input size as that input size approaches infinity. Well, why do you only worry about it as it approaches infinity? Well, it's because that's when the effects of the algorithm actually start to really matter. Uh, and that's also when it's really going to be something where uh, you're running into more problems in more environments because of how long it's taking or how many resources it's using. If an algorithm is you know, really, really fast or doesn't use very much memory when operating on small input sizes, it doesn't really matter what the complexity is because that's this is an extraneous case. So we worry about the size as it grows uh, as it grows toward infinity because that describes how the algorithm will actually scale going forward. Also, when input sizes are very small, there's a lot of things like constant overhead factors and setup costs and things like that which actually start to dominate the calculation. Um, those are not very important from the point of view of large scalable systems. Uh, in certain environments they are very important and uh, the people who work in those environments are at least aware of those things though, so they're usually more sensitive to those factors. But as Looking at algorithms overall, how does something scale as its input size becomes very, very large? That's what we look at with computational complexity. So we can measure a lot of different things. It's a, the definition of cost isn't the same for everybody. Usually it's CPU cycles, but also it could be other things like bytes of RAM you're allocating. Uh, sometimes it's how many times you allocate memory that, that happens, or how many times you access memory. That happens sometimes too. Uh, there's also disk accesses, for example, which is one which is common in, say, database programming and optimization, uh, but doesn't usually show up in other areas. So these things end up being somewhat domain-specific. Now, the way we describe this is we have big O, which means that, which is the common one that we all use. Uh, it means that there's some function such that um, my algorithm's complexity is always bounded above by that function times some constant number. Uh, so this is usually the one we use because that's kind of the thing you wanted the answer to the question for. There's also big omega which is kind of the opposite. It's basically the yes this function there exists a function times some constant which is always lower than the cost of my algorithm. Uh, this is a, has more relevance in terms of the actual mathematics behind it not really something we talk about much in computer science because we're usually worried about uh, how to put bounds above things not bounds below. Um, and then big theta is the one that you get when you sort of combine the two of these. Now, technically, this is the one which we should probably be using more often, um, but we always refer to big O, and we all understand what it means, and really that's the thing we're worried about anyway, the bound above. Uh, so the thing that you'll notice, too, whenever looking at these is there's never any constants in the function. In fact, there's only ever one kind of multiplicative term. Uh, and this is because things like constants, well, as the data... The constant might matter when your input size is 1. It's like, well, now you're, you know, n plus 100. The 100 is the really big part. But as n becomes something like a million, the 100 doesn't matter. So that's why we don't talk about the constants, because they kind of cease to be important over time. And they don't factor into this when we start talking about there's a constant times my big O function, which is always above the cost that I'm worried about. Well, if that cost has a plus 100 in it, the constant is going to be the constant you're multiplying by is going to become bigger than that very quickly, so it doesn't matter. So in English, what do these things actually mean? Well, big O means, like I said before, bounded above by, um, whereas big omega is bounded below by, and big theta, of course, being the bounded above and below by. Now, what this means, uh, I'd referred to this a bit before with the there's a function and you can multiply some number by it and it'll always stay above or below uh, the cost you're interested in. In the case of big theta, it's actually going to be the same function can be multiplied by two different constants, such that one constant always keeps it above and one always keeps it below. So you have this, like, this tight sort of squeeze on the actual cost. 
Now, this is where big O is what we often end up using, uh, even though big theta is probably more appropriate. Uh, but that's generally something we don't worry about too much. Uh, big O is just the common approach, and it's not wrong. It's just not necessarily as tight a statement. Uh, but it's usually what we're most interested in anyway. So math, here's, an, here's a math example that actually just shows, okay, well, what do I actually mean when I'm talking about a function above and below and things like that? Well, here's a function, f of n, 3n squared plus 6n minus 7. A really basic second-degree polynomial. So the common way that we would end up expressing this is saying, okay, well, f of n is uh, a big O of n squared because, okay, say I multiply n squared by 4. Well, clearly, as n becomes large, 4n squared is always bigger than this function because I can say that there's a constant like that that at a certain po finite point becomes bet larger than the function I'm looking at for the rest of infinity, therefore it's uh, big O of n squared. Now, we could also say that Realistically, there's a there's a big theta of n squared for this as well, which is probably the, the kind of tighter answer. Uh, they're both correct in this case. Other ways we could express this just to kind of point out that yeah, you can say some things which are not as helpful about this, but still technically correct, is things like this is the the big omega of n squared. It's like, well, it's true since I was able to say that it's big theta of n squared, it must be both big O and big omega of n squared because uh, it kind of requires that both of those exist, but not really that helpful. Uh, as well, we could say it's the big O of n to the 100. Sure, uh, 1 times n to the 100 is much bigger than 3n squared for sufficiently large numbers. In fact, not very large. Uh, it's just not very helpful to know that. That's not a very tight bound on the actual behavior we have. And also, we could make a similar statement of, okay, well, it's the function is going to be the uh, big omega of 1 which it means constant overhead. So it's bounded below by a constant. Well, yeah, that's true for everything. Um, but that's also, that also shows how we'd express this if it did have constant overhead of some sort. You can have functions which have things like uh, additional storage allocated, it'll be big O of 1, because it just says, okay, well, it, it allocates a certain number of things when it starts up, and that's all it ever uses. So common uses for this thing. CPU cycles is usually what we end up talking about. So there'd be something like, Okay, quicksort uses the big O of n log n comparisons in the common case. This is a true statement. It's one that people use all the time, and it's sort of a mainstay in a lot of computer science. You can come up with other environments, too, though, where you can talk about other, other kinds of costs, memory consumption. You might say generating this summary with some summary or analytics engine or something like that requires big O of n storage overhead. Okay, for some, some computations doing, it actually needs something which is roughly equivalent to the size of the input. <clears throat> or at least scales as the size of the input increases does linearly. And then you can also have disk access. You could say things like, well, this query will force our cache to read the big O of n squared disk blocks. In which case it's going to sound like, okay, well, we're either going to have to do something to... Um, make sure that the cache stays at a certain size relative to the input such that we know we can prove that that number stays small or that we can say in the general case there we can shave off a factor there or we need to change something about the query optimizer such that it actually uses the memory it has in a better way. So these things all come up in different environments depending on what you're trying to build. So I hope that was a basic background as to um, how these things are used and why we talk about them and, and why they look the way they do, why it always looks like this very terse sort of big O of n squared. It's like I'm sure the, the analysis for the cost of the function is more complicated than that one term. It's like, well, yeah, it is, but it usually doesn't matter. Uh, and as numbers get very large, it doesn't really matter in any meaningful statistical sense there either. So uh, that's why we end up simplifying it, just to make things easier, because those other factors just don't matter in the end. Um, so I hope that was a basic explanation as to why we talk about things in those ways. Uh, like I said, if you're looking for a very in-depth explanation of the math behind it, with some nice graphs showing how this works over time as functions grow, um, take a quick search through YouTube, because there's lots of great examples of that where people talk about it. Um, these three functions usually and they describe exactly what that means to be bounded above or below by a, a constant and what that would look like if you were to graph it. Um, 
in the future, I might try and do a talk talking about how we could derive the cost of a, the, the, uh, the computational complexity of an algorithm, but it is not something where it's, there's a general case process to do so. It's generally speaking quite time consuming and not always something you can think that you'll be able to get done in a reasonable amount of time. Sometimes they're very, very complicated. Um, so anyway, I hope that background helps. And uh, send me an email or post comments if there's anything uh, on your mind. Thanks.